Uh, good morning to those of you who are who are here today. Um, today we're going to be talking about segment uh, seven segment displays. Um, and this idea came from somebody on the Cabinet Vision eSupport forums. We have for years um, struggled with basically custom dimensions. I mean, I even have a couple here on my screen that I use some, some shop annotation tricks to get going. Um, it was decided at my organization that we want to see our depths in the lower left rather than the default like top right position that Cabin Vision provides. And um, because we build a lot of closets and because of the nature of closet construction and installation, we want a way to see what we refer to as like inside dimensions. And so like on a 30 inch cabinet, the inside dimensions are, you know, 28 and a half. It's just the cabinets width minus the thickness of the left and the right ends. And again, that that's really primarily just because of the way you build or the way we build closets. Um, but this is limited and you can only get these like this trick that I have here working with certain views in the software. Um, you can't, as far as I recall, um, you cannot get this to show up in like a cross section view of a cabinet or something like that. So anyway, for, for a variety of reasons, um, it's challenging to, to get things to dimension kind of automatically when cabinet vision does not provide them by default. You know, we don't have the ability to dim CAD with a UCS. Um, and we don't have the ability to move CAD around with the UCS or with any sort of intelligence. It's a very static thing. The best we've got is we can reference some parameters and get some text values or some numbers and do some math, but we can't move them. So anyway, um, the the user on the Cabinet Vision e support forums, who I'm going to let them remain anonymous, um, so I'm not going to share who it was. But if you're on e support, you can find it. Um, they they basically said I think that um, maybe their son showed them a video about seven segment displays, and it got them thinking. You know, how could I incorporate this into Cabinet Vision? Maybe this is a way that I can get my custom dimensions. Uh, or it was, that was roughly the gist, you know, I'm, again, I'm not trying to just read verbatim from it, just kind of talking about the general idea. And so it was mentioned, you know, could we use some SketchUp models and based on this or that, call the numbers up. And I, I still think that that's a, a reasonable approach. I think it might actually end up being a little bit easier even than what I've done here. Now that I really kind of worked out the math for extracting each digit um, that I want to have extracted. And so maybe that's actually ultimately the best solution. But to be completely honest, the stream today is really, it's really because I had a lot of fun doing this and because I want to share it. Um, it was a really fun challenge. And I do think that there's value to, to be had from this. And I do think that after I sort of digest this a little bit further, I know that there's going to be much more elegant ways to do this. I know that I will come up with different ways that I want to use it. And so, you know, time will tell. But for now, it was a really fun thing to do, and I'm just kind of excited to talk about it and share it. Now, I've got, you can see in the lower left over here, basically just a little sort of like image of the 10 possible digits that I wanted to display. So obviously, right, zero through nine, those were the only integers we have. Um, well, single digit. Anyway, so 
you'll see on my screen here, I actually have, sh I'm showing 24 three different times, right? And so this 24 right here is actually the UCS that I wrote to get, to get this going. So you'll notice again, the two looks just like the two over here and the four looks like the four over here. Um, obviously that's not difficult to follow, but making this happen, I didn't even really consider the possibility of doing something like this until I saw that person post on the forums and I went and watched a, a YouTube video that they linked. But this is actually not all that hard. This is actually, it's really quite simple. And I'm gonna like kind of pat myself on the back a little bit here because I worked out a way to build this that apparently, um, apparently is a is a common it's probably the way to do it ultimately um but this image over here that you're seeing in the lower right i pulled up this morning so that we could have something to reference and the interesting thing about it was that there's some information right above these numbers here that that basically outlines exactly the way i made these different digits appear and I'm going to try to show this real quick, if you bear with me. It's not going to make much sense, but I'll show it anyway. So this right here, DCBA, not really very important, but the output section here, right, for 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, this is, you know, essentially it's like a binary sort of like code, right? And so for the number zero, if you take your segments, your seven segments here, and you assign a letter to each of them, which in my programming, I assigned numbers to them, you know, the number zero, it just tells you right here which one of your segments you need to turn on or off. And so it's actually extraordinarily simple if you break it down like this. Um, anyway, I'm gonna um, kind of We'll talk a little bit more about that later when I show the code, but um, really without going a whole lot further, let's talk about what this takes. So I've got a bunch of values when I select this empty base object here that I've created. Everything that starts with the 99, I've created for this purpose. And a lot of them are really just like debugging purposes. I needed to be able to see on the fly what I was doing while I was working through this but some of them are functional and the ones that are functional are the font weight which is actually kind of cool i think um so if you wanted this to be like really really fine and narrow you could do 0 0.001 i don't think you should go less than that um i think cabinet vision actually kind of has problems when you get past this degree of precision um but anyway that's beside the point so if you or if or if you wanted it to be like a little more bold you know you could go with zero one and the thickness of each of these little segments that gets that gets dimmed increases <clears throat> i also have number height as a potential value so if you want it to be a little bit taller you just change the height of it which actually then allows you to kind of increase your weight further if you wanted to you you know you need to have a little bit of a bigger number if you want to have the segments a little bit thicker like this so as, I, um, as we go through this, I'm going to just kind of go back to where I like it. Um, one of the other things when I was watching this video about the seven segment display that was mentioned is uh, these numbers are almost always intentionally slanted a little bit. And I couldn't find any information on like what's the industry standard slant degree. So I just picked one to start with, but I actually built it into the the code for the parameters that control this so that you as the user do actually get to choose if you'd like to change it. So maybe you wanted this to have, you know, a five degree slant instead of a two and a half degree slant. And, you know, you can, you can really just you can go pretty extreme if you want to without it like kind of breaking. Oh, look at that, someone's playing Rust. Um, so anyway, 
This number width is really a display. This is something that is, it's from, from this point down more or less, it's not all debug. Um, the number spacing here, I set up so that the numbers could be, you know, moved closer together, spaced farther apart. And then my X origin right now is just a display and it's to keep my number directly above or as, as much as I can really without finishing the rest of the code above my cabinet width again. So I can, so I can try to kind of debug this as I work through it. So uh, that number is, dy is dynamic right now and, and it's more or less half of the cabinet's width. And then the Y origin is something that right now I, I just like, um, I left it so that I could edit it. And really, again, most of this stuff is just kind of like debugging, but I'm, I'm trying to show you guys the way I worked through this in case you're interested in doing something like this, or in case you, you know, want to actually take this, which I hope somebody will, and do something like way better than I ever could with it. So I just, we're just kind of going through like how I got here. And I'd really like to hear from any of you that have any advice for how we could improve upon this. So the rest of this information is me extracting the integers from the size or from, from whatever thing I'm trying to measure, right? For this example, I have this all tied to my cabinet's width, but this could be tied to whatever, whatever number you want. It could be tied to the cabinet height. It could be tied to the depth. It could be tied to a parameter that you define somewhere. It's all pointing back to the same thing. So it's really flexible in that regard. You just need to pick the target that you're trying to measure or display numbers about, but you have to kind of pick a range. And right now, when I started this, at least, I had planned on really working out 99.999 to zero. Uh, there's no, I have, didn't really have any plans to go any negatives. Um, and then I had planned to go three decimal points. So as you can see, I've got the tens, the, the ones, my tenths, hundredths, and thousandths. So that would be like, right, if I wanted to go something like this, and you guys are seeing how far I got with it. Um, I did manage to get the tenths place in as I was tinkering with this. and. You know, there's no question in my mind that I can get the next two in here. And I'm going to do some of that on stream today. But if you look down here, two for the 20, four for the four, and then one, two, five. And then I've kind of even reconcatenated the digits that I stripped down back together here. This is not just a display of my width. This is actually concatenating each of these with a decimal in place. And you'll see that later in the code. But how did I do this? Um, whenever I thought about this in the past, I don't know, my, I guess my lazy mind looked at this and said, oh, that's way too hard. I'm sure it's possible, you know, but gosh, what, what would it take? Um, that's going to be some kind of crazy math involved. The reality is that it's not. It's not some crazy math. It's actually so simple um, that I feel, I feel kind of silly for not seeing how easy it is earlier in my career. Um, but I will say that that is pretty much... A, it's, a, it's a result of me not knowing about what is now my favorite math function. And I so rarely get to use it. But when I do... I feel like it it kind of enables me to do things that otherwise I have no idea how I would do. And that's the modulus, um, the modulus operator, if you will. And so we'll jump into my code real quick and take a look at this. So this section right here, well, really all of this stuff is where we've done it. And so what is the modulus? 
uh, operator do? Um, essentially, it takes a number and, well, so if I want to do like 112 modulus 10, what that basically is going to return is it's going to take the number 112. It's going to divide 10 into it as many times as it can, and then it's just going to spit out the remainder. And so that might not seem like very much on the surface, but if you get clever with its use, you can do a lot of really neat things. So for example, how did I get my tens digit extracted from this? Well, I know that sometimes I'm going to have decimal values that are trailing. And when I'm focusing on the tens digit, I don't care about the, ten, uh, the, the trailing decimal values. They're actually just going to screw everything up about what I'm trying to do because they're going to be included in the returned value when I use the modulus operator. So I started by taking the number that I'm trying to report on, which again, remember I said this is all about my cabinet's width right now. So every one of these equations takes cabinet width into consideration. But specifically, I wanted to eliminate all decimal places from my cabinet's width. So first of all, I, I need to truncate that, right? But in order for me to get over and, and actually um, grab the number that I'm trying to get, which is the two in, in the, you know, in what I was showing you guys before, I've got a 24 inch wide cabinet or 24 and change, I'm trying to get that two. I'm trying to pull the two out of that. So what I need to do is I need to eliminate all of the decimal points, which I do again by truncating. And then if I take that new number, which is 24, but before I truncate it, I actually divide by 10, right? That's actually gonna give me 2.4. So if I've got a cabinet that's 24.125 and I divide that 24.125 by 10, I'm effectively shifting my decimal point one to the left. So 24.125 becomes 2.4125. Then I can truncate it and modulus 10. Now, as I'm talking my way through this, I'm kind of confusing myself, but I know that this is how this works. Um, and so, again, and you can, you can see right here, this is the formula, and when we, when we look back over here, my tens digit is two. So again, 24, if I divide this, and then truncate the value, I'm left with the two. So maybe in this particular case, for this particular value, I might not even need to do the modulus 10. Yeah, so for the tens value there, I did not even need to do the modulus 10. Really, I just needed to divide it by 10 and truncate it so that I was left with two. However, as we work our way down, we do need to start doing some math and multiplying these different numbers to shift the decimal point around before we truncate. But anyway, so, so this is the way that I was ultimately able to extract each of the digits out for what is going to be the map, I guess, for which segments get turned on within this seven segment display that, that I'm trying to build here. So um, after a while, I decided I wanted to go ahead and allow this to go above 100 because I don't really know what, what I or anybody might have any interest in using this for, but I wouldn't expect cabinets to be wider than 100, but a lot of other things will. So what I did in this particular case is if my cabinets with is greater than or equal to 100, then I did go ahead and put this hundreds digit in. And I'll show you 
if we jump out, I'll make the cabinet 101 wide and let you take a look at it. But then down here, again, just as another debug test. So as I was working through this, I could kind of see everything that was happening all at once without having to jump back into my UCS all the time or kind of without having to go like in and out. Um, I've concatenated each of these numbers together. And so just using the curly braces and a very specific decimal point, because I know where it's going to be, I can get this to, you know, put all of this back together. And this is, again, this is not just referencing the width of the cabinet. This is actually taking each of these stripped out digits and putting them back together. So once I sort of worked out how to get each of these digits stripped out from the measurement, the next thing I needed to do was work out what segments need to be turned on when. And so that's where all of this kind of comes into play. I, I sort of did it both ways, right? I first kind of broke down which numbers have the most segments that get used, thinking maybe this will be some way for me to figure out how to get this stuff turned on. And um, ultimately, working through it and trying to utilize this, I failed. Uh, I was getting the wrong things getting turned on and off. And so I decided to look at it from a different point of view, which was, you know, deciding, okay, so rather than which segments get turned on for which numbers, or how many segments get turned on for each number or whatever, why don't I look at this and say, okay, so for which numbers will each segment be used? And this ultimately here, is kind of what led me to what I was showing you earlier um, over here, which was more or less just like a string of ones and zeros. And so once I kind of worked all of this out and I got the digits stripped out, let me pause on that thought for just a little bit. Um, I want to just leave this, frankly, I just want to kind of leave the screen here for a minute. I'm going to try to post this UCS somewhere that is accessible for most people. But if you can't get it, I do want to at least show this for a little bit so you can like pause. If you have interest in figuring out how I got um, the lines that I'm dimming later to go where they need to go. And it basically amounted to a little bit of triangle math, um, just a little bit of trigonometry. It's not very complicated. It's, you know, if you took any trig, it's the Sokotoa concept with right triangles. Um, you need to be able to determine the hypotenuse of a right triangle. You know the, you know, you know the angle of all three points on your triangle, all three of your angles, you know them because one of them you're defining at two and a half. The other one is 90 because it's a right triangle. Um, and so then the last one is just, you know, subtracting 90 from whatever you divide, uh, whatever you enter here, you know, you subtract that number from 180 and that gives you your third angle. So I'm not going to try to teach trigonometry. I would do a terrible job. But basically, um, using, you know, using a little bit of trigonometry, I was able to determine how to program the lines that I'm going to dim later to, to work with the values that I was showing you guys, you know, to make the font more bold, if you will, to make the, the numbers all higher and to change how slanted or italicized it is. Starting out with the foundation of how do I actually get this to happen was probably the most important part of this for me. And I mentioned on the Cabin of Vision forums before I started streaming that <clears throat> When I started programming 
um, I started with Cabinet Vision. I had never done anything prior to Cabinet Vision. I didn't realize I wanted to program. I didn't realize I would like it. I have no formal training. I just sort of like stumbled into it and found that I really liked it. And so that's been really nice because for me to learn, a lot of it has been driven by self-interest, which is always, you know, going to help versus being forced to do something. But I've made so many frustrating mistakes and so many just clumsy moves along the way. And I still make them constantly. Uh, my code is barbaric, um, but there are some things that I have learned and genuinely one of them is before you start working on a project, try to just kind of talk yourself through it and ask yourself, okay, what am I going to need in order to make this happen? Fair enough, it is probably better barbaric than non-existent. Um, but, you know, what, what am I going to need to make this work? What am I going to need to make this happen? What kinds of different pieces of information am I going to need to work with in order to make this possible? And try, before you start coding anything, to build some small functions or some small tools to help you with this. Now, if you've done any like VBA for, you know, for Microsoft Access programming, you will understand, you know, what a sub is basically. And what I'm showing here is very similar to that, right? It's these small little routines or functions that you can call upon later when you need them without having to write all of this stuff again without having to rewrite the entire formula over and over and over. You know, I could, rather than this AZ, ACC underscore mid HZ shift parameter, rather than just defining it here, I could actually replace wherever this shows up with all of this. But it's so much harder to do, and it takes so much more effort to type. I'm not going to remember these two parameters that I that I came up with to represent some value. Um, and so I'm going to have to constantly come back up here and copy this and then go back down and paste it in my code later. Versus if you can just do all of this stuff up here at the top before you even start, if you can build these different tools or functions that you know you're going to need and pre-calculate them, everything about what you do later is going to be so much simpler. And so if there's one thing that I hope to share with anybody um, today in terms of like best practices for coding, it's this. Take the time before you start or as the first thing that you do, take time and ask yourself, what kind of work can I do now that's going to make everything about what I have to do with this later better? and build it as best as you can. Now, I will be completely honest. I came back and I added while I was working because I was, you know, I ran into things and I'm like, oh crap, I, I totally forgot. I know I'm gonna need this. I know I need to reference this. I'm gonna come back and I'm going to do this. One of them really was the font weight. I was not thinking even for a second about how nice it would be to be able to change the font weight and what actually encouraged me to add this and replace what was previously a static number with this value was once I started trying to put a decimal point in because the decimal point, and you'll see later, it still needs to be a different value, but I realized it was, it was way too tiny. I could not even see the decimal point as I had made it with the sizes that I had created. And it clicked like as soon as I did that, I was like, oh, great. OK, so, you know, people have different size screens, different resolutions, different eyesight, you know, different preferences in general. If I really want other people to be able to use this, I need to build in some sort of 
way to change the font weight. And so I came back up, you know, after I had already done a bunch of the other work and I stuffed this up here. And then honestly, I did a find and replace and everywhere that I had put my static 0 0.001 value in, I replaced it with this ACC segment thickness parameter that I created. And so, you know, again, you're, you cannot plan for everything, but plan for what you can as much as possible. And, you know, build, build upon what you've done before whenever you can. So this ACC number width would be a really good example of that. I am defining more or less how wide an individual number will be based on some of the information that I that I kind of like calculated further up, right? I am utilizing this mid HZ shift parameter that I created up here so that I can know how much space a given number is going to take up. And that only helps me because while I'm coding or, or working with this, it, it sort of helps me understand how to take the next steps. But later, um, I won't even show this ACC number width. Like if I, if I finalize this and I say, okay, this is, this is good. It's gonna, I'm gonna send it out into the world and just you know, make this available for anybody who wants to use it. This number width value will will change from being an attribute where we're seeing it if I even leave it, um, which I probably will leave it, but I won't show it as an attribute with a description anymore. It's just going to turn into, you know, the same thing that ACC mid HZ shift is, which is just a standard parameter that will go along with the code. So it's good for me while debugging, but I will get rid of it later. But again, the point I'm trying to make is build upon the things that you build to make the work that you have to do later easier. So anyhow, this section here is, is the dedicated section I've built for the ones position of whatever number we're trying to report. And so I've got I've got this set up so that, right, segment one is used for numbers 0, 2, 3, 5, 6, 8, and 9. Um, so what I could have done when trying to decide if the ones digit was a zero, I could have left out anything where the segment does not need to get turned on, right? I, I don't need to... I don't need to say, you know, dim segment two is false here because false would be the same thing as not even declaring it at all. But to make this code much easier to work with, because I know that this is gonna suck, honestly. Um, if I determine far later in my code that I've made a mistake, going back and retroactively doing upkeep on something like this as I have written will be vile. It will be awful because I'm taking an idea and I'm repeating it over and over and over because frankly, I don't, I don't know how to build something like this into a loop. Um, that's another thing I'm hoping somebody else might point out as a way that it could be done. I don't know how to do it. And so this is just, sort of like brute force going through all of the different conditions and saying, turn this on when this, but don't when that, blah, 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 right? So what that amounts to is a lot of repeat code that's a little bit different. So right here, I've got, you know, dim segment two for my ones digit section. But if I scroll down a bit further here, for my tens digit section, now it's dim tens segment one instead of dim segment one, right? So it's very, very similar. Similar enough that I was able to copy paste some text and then use find and replace 
to change dim segment one to dim tens segment one. But again, um, I don't want to get too far ahead. I want to talk a little bit more about why I am declaring this as a zero here rather than just omitting it. Because I could, I could omit that value and everything about this would still be fine. Because for a zero, I don't need segment two. Segment two is this one right here in the middle. I don't need it for a zero. So whether I set this to false or don't declare it or whatever, when the ones digit is zero does not matter. The reason I've included this is so I could just take this whole, when I wrote this first little check here for a zero, and I tested it and I determined that it worked. From that point, I copied this block of code and I pasted it for all of the possible digits that I could come up with, which again, we've got 10, right? What this allowed me to do then was literally just come through these and turn them on or off for each and every one of these numbers. And I kind of did that work in a, in a spreadsheet, I think. Let's see if I can find this. So just to kind of like simplify this, I worked out in this spreadsheet what would be needed where. And so I had this off on my second screen while I was going through this. And, you know, as I look at this for the number zero, these are the segments, right? That's a one, a zero, one, 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 one. One, zero, one, 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 one. So planning ahead and even going so far as to build myself a little spreadsheet here saved a tremendous amount of time and helped me prevent a lot of mistakes when I was going down and defining each of these values, right? It, it just, it, it saves time and it makes it easier. I'm building a tool, like a, a sub tool, a function that I can call upon later. And I cannot stress enough how much sort of grasping this idea and concept has helped me break down and dramatically improve my ability to code. Thinking about it all as one great big problem that you have to solve is impossible. It's too much. It's too much for me. My brain is not capable of holding that much um, information or that big of a plan. I have to break it down into little chunks. And unfortunately, Cabinet Vision sucks for doing that. But if you want to break your stuff into several different ECSs, you still can actually kind of break this down into modules. Yeah, a map. This that's exactly right. This is this is kind of like a map, right? We're we're just planning. It's just a roadmap for how we're gonna do what we want. So anyway, not to not to beat a dead horse, but this was very, very, very helpful for me to to go through. So once I got all of this and I knew that I had each of these sort of Boolean values correct, depending on what my ones digit value equals, then I decided it was time to start actually creating my segments. And you're gonna see throughout this code how many times I copied and pasted information like this so that again, I have a reference right here in front of me and I don't have to work through the information again. Um, it just helps out a lot to, to really give yourself notes to follow. And you'll see here the commented out 0 .001. This is what I was talking about before. I had gotten a lot of this work done before I realized I should not make these static values. These should be referencing a parameter of some sort so that we can change this later if we want to. Um, I've tested it, I know it's good, so I don't need to leave that comment there anymore, but let's kind of go through each of these segments. Um, I don't think I've got what I did before, but let's see.
I guess I could just maybe draw something over here since this is just a snip of a page. Um, so, I also drew myself a display like this before I started dimming any of these lines and I decided what I was going to call each of these segments. And so I think I did one, two, three. might as well just look in here and check for sure. Segment four, I decided was the vertical bottom left segment. All right, so there's my seven segments that I defined. And once I drew this diagram, I was able to kind of focus on my, my UCS. And then I could associate the segments with it. So if ACC dim segment one is true, right? Because that's, that's what this is. It's a Boolean on or off. So if I am being told that we want segment to be turned on, then dim black. And what is black? Black is just a system color. It's, it's nothing. It's just a, it's an object. It doesn't have a price associated with it. It will report if you let it, but I did this so that we could have like a black line. That's all it is. It's just like a black 2D object or 3D really. It's obviously, right? But it's just a it's just a line. So the if you're unfamiliar with part orientation, this is going to be very difficult. But basically um yeah, I'm not even going to talk about it beyond I'm just going to talk as if you know, and if you get confused right here, I'm sorry, but I don't have the right tools to work through this, to, to teach this. But essentially, um, when you dim an object, it always comes in with a default orientation. If your angle X, Y, and Z are all zero, you can assume that the DY runs up and down. So your length would be growing, you know, up or down and the dx is the left and right, or the width of something. Now, once you start rotating, that obviously changes um, in terms of how you view the object on screen. But ultimately, I wanted to set each and every one of these black objects up that I dimmed so that the dx, which would be the width, and the dz, which would be the thickness, as we're looking straight on at an object, would be basically very, very thin, 0 0.001 inches in this particular case. And then the dy, or the length of the object, would be each individual segment's length. So, you, you know, this might seem kind of odd. Why do I have this set as the horizontal segment length? I have it set as that because my horizontal segment length for, you know, one, two, and three they're all based on a different value I defined, which is the overall height. Um, I've got this set up so that the height is twice as tall as it is wide. And so every single segment will actually just be the same width. And so referencing it as ACC underscore HZ segment length was just the way I decided to go about doing it. Um, you, know, you, might, you might choose to do this differently. If you do, awesome. There's a lot of different ways to program, and I'd love to see the way you decided to do it. It might be, might be far superior, but this is kind of how I worked through it. And so that allowed me to always set the dy of my horizontal segments to be this value. And then when we get to the vertical ones, right, I've got the, the vertical segment length, which is, again, a function of the slant and the height 
So that's a good reason to set these up as parameter values rather than static values. So then your X, Y, and Z values obviously are placement, right? You should pick an origin. When you're going to be dimming several different objects and you're trying to keep them all together, it's very helpful to define an origin that you can always, always start from. And so I've got, again, my segmented number x origin value, which I, I think I showed you guys earlier, is tied to my cabinet's width right now. As you can see there on line 34, it's my cabinet's width divided by 2 plus some stuff. Um, and then the Y is the one that I am allowing us to control still. But I want these to be referencing parameters because I want every single object I'm dimming to register off of the same start point, right? For, for those of you guys who maybe operated a CNC before you came in and started using Cabinet Vision, um, that's kind of the path I went. Um, think about this as when you have to run like secondary parts or when you're dealing with flip operations or anything like that, um, right? You load your sheet up and you reference up in the corner of your CNC bed. You push your board up against very specifically located pins and those pins do not move. Those pins are always in the same place in relation to where the actual CNC is cutting. That is your reference point. So when you're programming something like this, where you're going to have a lot of different objects and they're all going to have to stay together and do something sort of um, like synchronized, I guess, you want to build a good reference point. And that's what this is. So then my Z value would just be my in and out. And for this, I left it at zero because whatever. And then since these are all of my horizontal segments, right, my, uh, my segment one, two, and three, as we've got drawn over here, one, two, and three, my AZ value is always going to be negative 90. So that I always have that leg of my seven segment on a horizontal. So as you go from dimension one, which is down here on the bottom, to dimension two, the x value needs to shift by a certain amount. It needs to shift by an amount that is going to be derived from how much you wish to slant your numbers. So ACC, ACC underscore mid HZ shift right here is using a little bit of trigonometry like I talked about before to determine on a triangle, right? Draw a crappy little triangle over here. Right, so this little point right here would be 2.5 degrees in this case. That was a pretty rough five there, sorry. Um, and then what I'm trying to figure out is how long is this little leg right here going to be? That amount is what this ACC underscore mid HZ shift references. So if we take the tangent of the number slant, which is this 2.5, and we multiply that by the number height divided by 2, um, which I think the divided by 2 is so I can get the individual leg. Yes, that's what it is, the individual vertical leg segment, which again, that, that's referencing this triangle here would reference basically right in this area here. This vertical leg would be the length of our vertical or really our horizontals. Anyway, I'm kind of talking um, myself in circles here. But basically, this mid HZ shift value is just using a little bit of trigonometry based on right triangle math to understand how much the second leg needs to be shifted over to the right 
from the origin depending on how much slant we want to give our number. And then segment three is actually going to multiply that number by two because it would be twice as much, right? It's already happened once going from one to two. It's going to happen again the same amount going from segment two to segment three. And I'll show you that right here. So <clears throat> yeah, I did not actually, I'm not displaying how much it shifts over, but basically if I measure here, my horizontal shifted by 0 0.0327. So if we, you know, kind of carry that on, My next measurement should be 0 0.0654. 0 0.0655. Close enough, right? Probably a little, a little bit of rounding going on there, something like that. Um, yeah, so that's what was happening, right? There's some, some rounding going on, and the 4 went into a 5 because of the 9, because, you know, I'm not showing 7 decimal points. Um, so anyway, that's, that's kind of how I did the math for the placement of these and getting them to shift their way over. And then for the vertical members, it was very similar. And I'm hoping that you guys are looking at this and saying, wow, this, this actually, you know, there's a lot to it. But it's a really simple concept. It's just iterations of the same sort of idea over and over. So one, two, and three were kind of, they were pretty easy for the most part. And again, this is all based on if ACC dim segment three equals one, then at the, at the line. And what determines whether or not dim segment three equals one? Each one of these little chunks here for the 10 possible integers that we want to display. So, right, the one's digit is zero, then we want segment one and segment three to have their Boolean values set to true, so that when we come down here to segment one and segment three, they make it past this if then query and you get the object. <laughs> it's I yeah I mean I don't know I I'm gonna be totally honest so I I think at this point I've got everyone able to see and read chat fairly well but um, basically I think UCSs get a lot of really bad publicity I think they get a lot of bad publicity because they are so poorly taught in general and because it's it's so much the wild west and people could do some really really bad things with user created standards but it's my go-to it is it is so my go-to for for anything like this i feel like user created standards have so much power in the software to make tasks easier for you. And I don't know, I guess I don't, I don't want to go and ramble too much about this. I am extraordinarily passionate about it, but I wish that more people used UCSs for more things because I think that we as a community would really benefit from having more examples of how these kinds of things can be done. Um, I don't share very much of my UCS stuff primarily because because um, I struggle with like shaming myself about what I build and I think it's all trash and I don't want everybody to see it and pick it apart and all of that stuff, which I, I really need to get over and just start sharing more. But um, like Perry Miller shares some freaking awesome awesome user created standards and 
I've learned so much from reading his code. And I think that if more people shared, it would just, I think we'd be a lot better off. But anyway, I digress. Um, I will say that I think a lot of the reason that I actually took this approach with this as well. What do you think all of these lines are? I think um, I just kind of like built upon this idea that we had and utilized before to dim these inside dimensions. Um, these are all just a bunch of lines that are exactly the same thing. And that's kind of where I got the idea in general to do it. So um, anyhow, we're going to kind of go through these vertical segments. Um, and actually, I'm going to, hey, Jim. Um, I'm going to pause for just a minute. I'm going to get a drink. And I'm also going to see what just happened because uh, I had some visitors for just a minute that my, my wife took care of. But just quick little couple minute break, guys. And I will be right back and we'll carry on. All right, so that was not five minutes. Sorry if anybody else ran off for a minute, but I'm going to go ahead and um, kind of resume. So, again, I kind of broke this down thinking to myself that these, these horizontal segments are going to be the easiest ones for me to start with. And the, the way that I coded this ended up being the way that I numbered or the way I numbered this ended up being the way that I coded it kind of happened at the same time I guess but anyway once I did the three horizontal segments which were by far the simplest to me I just kind of worked through the next ones and I don't know I don't think I really need to go over this a whole lot but basically the one thing that's different here has to deal primarily with this. Most of this other stuff is going to be very, very similar. Segment four being down at the bottom is going to have an X value that's probably identical to segment one. And the Y origin is probably going to be identical as well. We'll take a look up here. So, okay. So my bottom segment, I actually bumped up by its own width to keep the number itself contained within the height that we defined. But otherwise, segment one and four have exactly the same reference point. So no change there. The dy value obviously is different because we're focusing on vertical segment lengths now instead of horizontal segment lengths. And the vertical segment lengths will be the hypotenuse of the little triangle I drew. So they need to be calculated each time based on height and slant of the object. But otherwise, there's not a lot different, again, other than right here. And actually, before I go further, I didn't talk at all about this. If, um, 
if you've watched me program stuff like this before, you will probably know what this is for. But what this little line is essentially saying is for purposes of reports, and I'm nearly positive pricing if, if this like object I was dimming had a price to it, but for these purposes, I would like you to oversize yourself by negative your own width, right? Oversize your width by negative your width which means zero, right? So if it's 10 inches wide and we want to increase the width by negative 10, that's zero. And so a zero width object will never report. Um, if I did not have this black dot edx equals negative DZ, uh, dx line on every single one of these segments, when I run my reports, they will be littered with all of these things called black and they'd have all these different descriptions. So this is a really good way to, I don't know, I don't really know what the right word is for this, but if you want to play around with adding like visual aids in cabinet vision, but you don't want them to show up on a report, edx equals negative dx is the way to make it happen. <laughs> um, how many digits is it capable of? What do you mean, Jim? Because you didn't get to see, but... I guess technically it's all of them, right? Um, but right now I've only got the tens, the ones, and the tenths programmed. So as you can see, it does the one, but <laughs> it, it doesn't have the two and the five yet. All right. So <clears throat> there's not really a whole lot to even talk about with the rest of this. If you followed so far, you probably understand that at this point, it's really just a bunch of little, for segment five, if the thing I am telling segment five for the ones place is true, then dim a line and put it where we've defined it based on the parameters and, and things that we figured out before. Yeah, they're just on-off switches, right? So here's the part that kind of sucks. This is the like repeat iterations. There's no way, again, there's no way that I know of to get around it, but the good news is that it's just copy, paste, and replace. So now I'm checking for the tens digit as opposed to up here in this first section, I was checking for my ones digit. So if the tens digit that I've extracted from my original number that I'm trying to build this for is zero, then I'm going to set dim tens segment one. Right, tens segment two, tens segment three, blah, 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 blah. So then this is just another iteration of that. And then the same iteration of each of these dim some objects for, for the tens segment. So now I'm checking if ACC dim 10 segment one equals one, then do all of these things. Now the one difference, once I, cause when I started to do this next iteration, I just copied everything from here. All right, I copied all of this, uh, all of this stuff from here and I pasted it. And then I did some find and replace work. Once I did the find and replace work, I knew that I needed everything to be shifted over to the left or to the right of my origin by, by a very specific amount, really. Um, and so when I got to this point, this is when I went back and decided, ah, crap. Okay, I gotta, I gotta add this, um, sorry, this one here. Segmented number spacing. When I was 
starting with this originally, I did not have the foresight to think I should probably define a number to control the spacing of the digits. And so when I got to doing the tens place, I, I determined I needed to create the segment number spacing parameter to reference to control the X value. Everything else about all of these segments is identical to the first block of code, the first iteration for the ones though. It's just shifted in the X direction by my number spacing amount plus the horizontal segment length, right? It needs to be the length of the unit or rather the width of the number plus my spacing. So and I went through and got all of those ones done. So I'm shifting the tens place to the left. The tenths and the hundredths and the thousandths will shift to the right because my my reference point starts at the ones place. So when I got to this point and I realized we needed to start doing decimal points, um, the first thing I thought of was how am I going to get this to not display trailing decimal values? Because I hate trailing decimal values. I was so happy when they changed that and got rid of it in cabinet vision. I did not want to allow trailing decimals into this little thing that we built. So I basically got to thinking, well, how do I how do I check for trailing decimals? And that's that's fairly simple take the number that we're trying to work on, we're trying to display, which in this case is cap.dx, and subtract a truncated version of that. So 24.125 truncated would be 24. So if I take 24.125 minus 24, I've got 0.125 left over, so it's not gonna exit, right? Because if I don't have anything after that, then I don't, I don't really care about any of that. I don't want to dim a decimal point. I don't want to dim any numbers. So to sort of show this, right, I get 24.1, but if I go 24, we know I've programmed for this tenths place, right? Um, 01 even, so you, so you can tell. It is doing 24.0. It would display the one if I had programmed that so far. However, if I just go with 24, now that query or the little little if then that I built is going to resolve to zero because 24 minus 24 is zero. So I don't need a decimal point. I don't need trailing zeros, exit. I don't wanna do anything else in the UCS beyond that point. So, as I'm sure you can all imagine at this point, um, now that I've got the decimal point here, the decimal was really, is a little bit different, but it just amounts to, again, just kind of like facing DX on the origin, because we always want to start from whatever that X origin value is, and we want to build off of that to go left or right. I'm just going, you know, the horizontal shift plus the segment length plus numbered spacing, you know, again, it's, this is this is really just a little bit of math referencing some parameters. But you want to reference the parameters so that it remains parametric when you change your font weight or your slant or your font height. Um, I think that I I am not happy with this part of it right here where I've defined the actual size of the decimal point because when you try to get your, your segment thickness to a certain point, um, the math just, it blows the decimal point way out of proportion. So like if I wanted to, um, Well, 
obviously, right? That's way too, way too big in general, but 0.05, the decimal point is just way too big. So the equation that I've built is not a good equation for this, but it, it works right now for what I'm trying to do. And so I'm, I'm gonna leave it there. Uh, we'll refine this much later if I, if I decide to and try to build a better way to scale the decimal point up in relation to the other numbers. But for now, it, it is what it is. It is just 0 .001. Um, well, if you don't have hundreds, um, I set it up so that it would not show it, Jim, but if you go over 100, it shows up. But I have not programmed that one yet. So I'm, I'm extracting the 100s digit out here. Um, but interestingly enough, when I do that, I hadn't really seen that before, but it looks like I might have a little bit of a programming issue with my tens digit there or something. I don't know. But I'll work that out when I get to it. Right now, I'm just getting up to 100 and then three decimal points, and then we'll go, we'll go from there. Thank you, Jim. I appreciate it. I thought it was really cool too. That's why I wasn't even sure if anybody would really care a whole lot about this for like anything other than I think that this is really fun. I had a lot of fun with it and it's a pretty small crowd we get to share this cabinet vision stuff with. So thank you guys for showing up. All right, so again, decimal point and then it's just another iteration. Right, instead of tens digit, it's tenths digit. Dim tenths segment one instead of dim tens segment one, right? Come all the way through here and then I shifted positively here for my X for the tenths versus up here we shifted negative because on the tens places we were going left on the tenths we went right yeah you can see 3d <laughs> oh man what's with my dz there i need to fix that that should not be parametric as you can see i hadn't even looked yet or i would have seen that here we go. No, wrong. Oh, look at that. I didn't even see that I had done that. That's why it was so weird. <laughs> yeah, right? <laughs> All right, it's still thicker and I still would probably make it like stay where it needs to be. But yeah, there you go. You got a nice little, nice little 3D thing there. Um, and right, since it's black, obviously it's black, but if you wanted to, you could change the color to be whatever you want. I, with something like this, um, I would hide it if I were you, unless you specifically wanted to show it in 3D. Um, these lines right here for my inside dimensions that I was talking about before are the exact same type of thing. But for each of these lines that I'm dimming for my inside dimensions, I have it set up so that they are always hidden in 3D. And you might say, but hide doesn't work for the assembly editor. And if you did pick up on that, you are correct but there is a different way that you can hide things while in the assembly editor versus out in the room, which is by checking the, <laughs> guys, 
um, which is by uh, checking to see if you're in the assembly editor, right? So you can say before any of this UCS even runs, if your XX does not equal X, you know you're in the assembly editor, so exit. Um, and that's what I've got going on for these inside dimension lines here. That's why you cannot see them in 3D in the room. And you cannot see them in 3D in the assembly editor. Because again, hide does not work for hiding things in the assembly editor. It only works for hiding things in a room. So we've pretty much gone through this, but I'm going to actually walk through doing the next digit. And if you guys are interested, stick around. If you're not, thanks for coming. <laughs> so I don't need another decimal point, obviously. But I like having these sort of dividers here to help me know where I am in my code. You guys have probably seen me sort of scrolling and looking for them. And then obviously segment seven, six, blah, blah, blah. Those all help. They'll help, all help me out to stay organized. But once I've copied all of that, I normally like to put a few spaces so that it's really obvious as I'm working on my next section, and then just paste it. So there are a couple of different ways that you can do this. I strongly, strongly recommend if you are doing any find and replace um, realistically, the safest way to probably do it is going to be to do this. Copy the entire thing, or even really probably just like cut it out. And rather than even pasting it, um, Notepad++, you guys have seen me use this before. Um, as you can see, all of my scratch notes, like I use this constantly, all the time for like SQL query, debugging, all sorts of things. I strongly suggest you guys get this and use this, but if you paste it, then you can safely use find and replace without wrecking all of your other code and without having to be careful about what you replace. So you can, I think it's search replace or control H is the shortcut. And what I'm looking for is I want to change tenths digit. And I want to make it say hundredths. THS, yep. And I want to replace all. So that went through and quickly swapped all of my ifs. And then I want to change din tenths segment to dim hundredths segment again, just making very certain I have spelled this correctly. And because of the way that we pick specific sections of code, there really shouldn't be any um, concerns about having changed any of the rest of this stuff. And so the last thing that I would do here is I need to take this number here, the amount that we're shifting by. And if I'm not mistaken, just multiply it by 2. And copy all of that, come back over here, paste it, and test. Piece cake. So oh, let's do the next one. <laughs> so
long freaking ECS. <laughs> Hmm, something didn't work out there. So, maybe uh, for some reason. My find and replace missed. I might have been in the wrong spot in Notepad or something. But it missed these top two. I missed a couple of them. Okay, it missed like almost all of them. I think my find and replace, I was probably down in, like at the bottom of the ECS and so it just, or yeah, at, at the bottom of the code in Notepad++. I think that's why it didn't catch all of those, but. Well, see, now I'm just like screwing everything up, jeez. Oh, right. So it's correct now, but uh, guess who didn't think to change this? Right, because we're going over another decimal place, right? And Honestly, so I, I don't mind making the mistakes in front of everyone. Um, this is programming. This is programming. I think the, the thing that separates really good programmers from bad ones are uh, the ones who make sure they make checkpoints so they can go back and recover their code when they make mistakes. Or at least that's part of it, right? There we go. 24.125. Yeah, very much so. So. Let's just kind of check it out, right? So now we've got this nice little display. And it's working for... the entire range of numbers I was hoping to make it work for. So you can, um, using fill, it will fill these in, but that's the only way that you'll actually get to see the color when you're in elevation. Otherwise, it's gonna follow something about your layer settings. I don't know precisely what it's gonna follow. Um, I think it's objects. Yes. So dimming the black part or whatever the way it is makes it an object for your layers. Um, if you wanted this to be something other than an object for purposes of coloring on your drawings, you just need to pick some sort of different thing to dim for it. And then if you pick something that has a price, you have to force the price to zero or however you do your pricing, really. But here you have it. So, um, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> 
right in here, Jim. The ones and the point ones. A little more space on the other, on the right hand side of the decimal, you think? Yeah, I think you're right. And that does make sense because I think I shifted, I've got the decimal point shifted over, but I didn't think to shift all of the other numbers as much as I shifted the decimal, so. I guess everything else I really ought to just shift by like. Segment thickness. I'm not really sure what would be a good reference for that. Not really, I probably don't need to parentheses this, but. But this is also another really good example of what I was kind of mentioning before, which is that if you don't get this right the first time you go through the iteration, correcting it really kind of sucks. Because now what was before kind of, at least it sort of like made sense, each iteration got things shifted over just like a little bit more. Um, I would have much rather liked to see this like to the left in here some, but I, whatever. Uh, maybe that was not quite enough. Maybe it was. Um, Jim, I will show you this though. I don't think you were here um, I did program a couple of things into this thing. Um, so you can control... Wow, that really... That, that will definitely need some work. Everything needs to shift with that same little number. Okay. Anyway, we can change the, the slant. Um, you can make it taller or whatever if you want to, and it kind of like stays parametrically um, the ratio of height to width stays the same, is what I was trying to say. And then again, I think I might have shown you this, but you can kind of you can kind of bolden it up a little bit. So I I really hope that somebody takes this and and kind of like build something for it. Like, I know people talk a lot about wanting door dimensions. Um, this would do it. This would absolutely give you your door dimensions on your assembly sheets or whatever it is that people are asking for. We don't make doors, so I don't care, honestly. Um, <laughs> just, I'm not gonna do it, is I guess what I'm saying. I'm not gonna take this and do that, um, but yeah, I don't know. Take take this, take this and do something cool with it. I want to see, I want to see some really cool dimensions somehow. Um, one thing I want to do real quick while we're here still is I had built this originally so that with two digits it stayed sort of centered. But as you can see, as the number of digits beyond the decimal place grow, the center of my dimension is not centered underneath or in between my other dimensions. So like, I think I need to build something in that shifts my X origin depending on the number of decimal places. And I'm not really sure what that logic is, but I did not know that JJ wrote a dimension in UCS. That's cool for, for doors. Or just like basically this kind of thing. Hmm. 
have to check the forums. That's cool. I didn't even know it. I mean, is it kind of like the inside dimensions that I've got showing? Something like that? Or... Ah. Uh, yeah, you can see that. And as as I kind of mentioned before on, on this when we started, I... Uh, I don't necessarily know that the segmented numbers like this is any better than like pulling in SketchUp digits because it's it's the same concept, right? It's just extracting the individual like placeholder numbers and then depending on what their value is, assigning something. It might actually take less code to do this with SketchUp objects, but you know, I I, I do think that some of the original point was the snap points on the SketchUp objects can kind of get out of control. And I think that this is probably fewer snap points. I, I do. Oh, we advertised it. Huh. Well, that's kind of crappy of somebody to do, honestly. I think JJ can can give away whatever he wants to if he made it it's his yeah that's like that's his stuff oh whatever there's attitudes like that that drive away good people from the forums myself included Ay. um i am gonna work through kind of centering this out real quick if you guys want to hang out um and chat and stuff that's cool I'll kind of talk my way through it. But for the most part, I've kind of got done what I wanted to get done. And um, if this is something that I'm not able to get on like my first or second try, I'm probably just gonna put it off until another time. Um, so anyway, so basically um, what I'm gonna need to check for is number of different decimal places, right? I need to shift my origin so that it shifts everything over by a certain amount whenever I start getting additional decimal places. <clears throat> so it's going to kind of amount to let me see I've already kind of done something like this So this is basically the concept, and I'm bringing it up here so I can reference it. So I'm taking a value, and I'm truncating a different value, and then if the results are a certain way, you know, I'll be able to do something. Um, And I kind of want to build this in a almost in a cascading fashion, I guess. Um, hmm. I'm I'm way overthinking this. This is ridiculous. I've already done all of this work. Rather than reinventing it, all I really need to do is is check these values, but I can't check them up here if I'm defining all of this information down here. I need to define all of this first. So I'm actually going to move this up above. Because nothing about any of this 
actually relies on any um, parameters that I've created. So this can just be right up here at the very, very top. And then now that I've created them at this point, I can check the values and shift based on that. And I can just start by checking the thousandths first. Right, if it's not zero, then because I don't really want to show a number if it's a zero. Although I need to check. Because we didn't have these extra digits before, we just kind of programmed those right now. So if I go nine nine zero. I will probably get a zero on the end, yeah. Which I don't want, but I'm not gonna I'm not gonna do anything about right now. So right now this formula by default is basically trying to center the decimal, I think. Just verify again real quick rather than guessing. So kind of kind of centering in between the one and the tens actually. That's what's happening. Because I think when I add a decimal, it just kicks it off to the right without actually shifting the position very much. Yeah. Well, honestly, I don't think I'm going to go through this on stream. I don't really feel like working out all of the math. Um, there's a way that I know I want to do this, but it's going to take me time to work it out. As I'm thinking through this, um, this is one of those things where I feel like it would be better if I build some sort of function at the beginning of the UCS and then use it over and over down below. And what I am going to do is, depending on what the number is, I'm actually going to just figure out how wide the entire entity is by taking the number of digits displayed and multiplying it by the, um, the individual number's width. And then I'm going to shift the x origin to where it needs to be so that it's centering the entire set of numbers. And since I don't want the zeros to show up, I need to do some more programming to make sure that trailing zeros are always removed the way they are when we just go like 24. We're not getting 24.000, even though that's my you know concatenated strict digits down here. I need to apply the same concept to each digit specifically after, and that's just going to take some time. So I don't even know what a kerning variable is. Maybe that's what I'll go look at. What's a kerning variable, Jim? Yeah, I'll look it up while, while we're waiting.
Hmm. Okay, I think I understand the general concept. Right, it's like using a uh, justified font. I think that's like um Right, blah 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 whatever. And if this was all formatted that way, it would be what this thing is supposed to do, right? So that this all ends up at the same width. Well, this did not do at all what I was thinking, but I haven't written in Word with formatting mattering in so freaking long that I'm not surprised, I guess. Oh, never mind. I think I understand what I did wrong. That, that's right. So it's all, it's, it's adjusting, even though there's no way that this should all actually end up looking the same width the way it is, the kerning variable is forcing it to do that. Is that about right, Jim? Sorry, I don't have like any real words to type up here real quick or stuff in here. <laughs> Anyhow, I do think that's the idea. And yeah, I think you're right, but I don't know, unless you know how to teach me how to do it, I'm going to be doing it my own way. <laughs> right. A K is wider than an L. An F is narrower than a D, but wider than an I, etc. I gotcha. The one, the one reason why I would argue that that should not be done here is really and truly just that this is modeled after like a seven segment display, which is intended to be an actual like analog, not really analog device, it's a digital display, right? But the spacing is fixed on them. But I totally understand what you're saying. I, I think I just want to try to shift the entire grouping of digits depending on how many there are left or right. <clears throat> Yeah, that's all right. This was supposed to just be a fun stream anyway, right? <laughs> so anyway, I guess I guess kind of like ultimately my point is that I think to to wrap up the details on this and put the finishing touches on this particular one, um, I'm going to need some time, probably another hour or so to work out the little the little bits I haven't done yet, but I do want to point out once again how um, planning ahead and building those functions when you're writing ECS will help you a lot. If I had thought about how this needed to be shifted and really decided that rather than just trying to kind of have fun with this and see if I could get numbers going, if I worked out before I even started with that, where all of this stuff needs to go, I might have actually planned for my X origin position to be different than where it is. So um, just to, again, just kind of like further, further evidence of how important it is when you're writing ECS um, to plan, to plan ahead, take your time, think your way through. Um, and it will, it will really help you out in the end, so. <laughs> thank you guys as always um, for contributing for the conversation while we do this for pointing out the different things that are going on um, 
you know, asking me to look at it in 3D helped me see another little issue that we had with this. It's just... I didn't expect having people watch me program would would help me as much as it does. I really thought I would be super weirded out by it, but this has just in general been a really awesome experience with all you guys, so thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, thank you guys for being the rubber duck. It helps out tremendously. So if you guys have, um, if you have any specific questions about this, let me know. I'll post the UCS on the Cabin Division eSupport forums and the Reddit thread that I created for this when I finish up, just in case anybody's here from Reddit that doesn't have access to eSupport. Um, and if you happen to be here from LinkedIn by chance, um, I don't have a good way to post code blocks on LinkedIn, I don't think. So I'm not going to punish you by making you have to fix formatting and all of that. If you're interested in the code and you got here from LinkedIn, send me a message and I will either give you a little notepad that has the code in it so that your formatting is maintained or give you a link to the Reddit cabinetry forums where you'll be able to go and copy paste from the code block there. And otherwise, um, I guess one last little announcement or mention. Um, I've been hit or miss on my streams. I am not sure. I don't think most of you guys would have any way of knowing this. I, I've, I've shared this with very few people, but um, interestingly enough, somehow I've made it all of this time without catching it, but I got COVID a couple of weeks back and it absolutely wrecked me. And so that's why there was no stream with no notice or anything of there not being a stream. And honestly, I'm still not really at 100%. I am, I am I'm fine, obviously. I'm here, I'm alive, I'm working, and all of that. But um, that's kind of the reason behind the disruption to the stream. From here on out, we should be doing, once again, every other Friday. Um, occasionally... We'll do two Fridays in a row, but I shouldn't be going for like three weeks or more without streaming again, without notice at least. Um, unless, of course, I get COVID again, but I doubt it. So anyway, that's it for today. Thank you guys for coming and contributing again. And I hope that, um, I hope that somebody comes up with something based on this or even their own thing that I can learn from and we can share. See you guys.